Tonight's message is going to be simple because you already said that I can be who I am. And uh, I will tell you right now, I will kind of give you the uh, kind of the caution. I am not that intelligent. And uh, I know some of you, I have met some of you already in past, multiple times as a matter of fact. This is not my first rodeo, as some would say. Um, And yet I'm awful with names. And so if I point, then you're going to have to be okay with that because I barely passed high school. Um, (laughs) It's just the way it is. Uh, Also, uh, my my mission in, in life has always been something of extreme uh, some would call it reckless. I just call it obedient. Because it's not about me questioning God what he has called me to do. And again, it's not to become popular and all of that. I think I have like 1,400 friends on Facebook, and I'm really truly friends with maybe 100 of them. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. And so I believe God has a word for you tonight. And uh, we're actually going to be going in a book that... Uh, God has really just set it in my heart, and uh, we're going to go through an entire book in the Bible tonight. Isn't that amazing? Are you, are you ready? It it's, uh, starts with a J. Jonah. And so some of you are getting worried because John's a big one. Um, <laughs> At least it wasn't, you know, Leviticus or uh, Deuteronomy. We could have done it. Um, I did Deuteronomy once, and uh, I think there was three people at the end of that service that were left over. <laughs> Everybody else was uh, at Applebee's. But um, no, we're going to be talking about Jonah, and, and I really want to spend the time tonight in chapter three of four. There's only four chapters. I know some of you are really worried, but there is only four chapters, and most of them only have 10 verses in them. But this is really about a story about a man named Jonah that had a calling on his life. And it was very evident, in fact, God had specifically asked him and called him to go to a place called Nineveh, which, not to take too much time in the historic value of this place, but Nineveh was kind of a a city, a suburb of Assyria, which ultimately was a lot of heathens or pagans, and ultimately was the birthing place of what was later to be known as Babylon. Now, this is important because even though we are in the book of Jonah and we'll reference Jonah, we're not talking about Jonah tonight. We're actually talking about a king, an unnamed king that is later on in this story in chapter 3. So chapter 1 goes something like this. God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to basically not make friends with them, come on, but to go there and say, hey, in 40 days... God is going to kill all of you. Have a good day. And then that's it. How many of you would run to that kind of calling? To go into a city you've never been before with people that don't speak your kind of language, to tell them not so good news that God is going to kill them. Not spank them, not uh, teach them a lesson or even give them uh, punishment. That would be good. Come on but to just kill all of them. Not very exciting. And so Jonah, like some of you, probably me at least, and can I just tell you, if there's some of you, and I believe that there are, there's some of you that are struggling tonight with a sin in your life, and you're worried that, well, I'm disqualified or I feel kind of left out. I really felt that tonight during worship. Can I just tell you that I sin better than you? Can I, do, can I just go ahead and say that? I try. I, I really do uh, not try to sin, but I sin very well. And I'm just telling you that because here I am. What the enemy would try to do in the mind games and in the heart games, the truth of the matter is I give it to the Lord every day. Because the best thing I could do is die to myself. You see, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but if I let God allow me to die first then he's already lost that power over me. Amen? Amen. Come on. You see, there's times where if we just stop and say, I die to myself today, the enemy has no ability over you anymore. Because there's nothing to kill because you're already dead. Amen? Come on. Did you catch that? It's already a done deal. When you say, Lord, what I wanted to do today, I die to that. I give it to you. 
In that moment, the enemy has lost his ability to get a foothold on you or a stronghold on you because there's nothing to hold on to anymore. You're already to the Lord. Amen? So anyways, Jonah goes and he runs the other way, the Bible says, the opposite direction, as some translations would say. I find it interesting that not only do we dodge our calling, but we literally will run the other way. Some of you, you will know what God's calling you to. Just look in the opposite direction. Amen? And so he went to the docks, the kind of ocean side, and he went on a boat that was headed to a place called Tarsus. And it was full of people that were not believers in the Lord, uh, but instead they were believers in, in their own doing, their own vices, their own pagan religions, and so on and so forth. And so as they set sail to Tarsus... Uh, they find themselves in a huge storm. And everyone is screaming, crying out. They're making sacrifices. They're trying to figure out what can we do. They're doing things in, hear this, they're doing things in the natural. They're throwing things off the boat, trying to lighten the load. And then they're trying to do things in what they think is the supernatural. They're casting lots, trying to figure out what is the reason for all this? Why are we going to die? And so then they go look for Jonah. And the Bible says that Jonah is sleeping on the boat. Now, we see this one other time in the Bible where there's a huge storm and someone is sleeping on the boat. And his name was Jesus. And I found that God was beginning to speak to me on why this is. You see, Jonah has seen God do miracles. Jonah does not get caught up in those types of things, storms and uh, and huge things, because Jonah, deep down, he knew that there was a call on his life. And so God was carrying him. But everybody else is not used to the Lord. You see, at times in your life, storms may rise up. And I see this all the time. I see at times uh, pastors, leaders, and everyone in between. A storm will hit your life, and quickly you will find yourself crying out to all kinds of things. You will try to lighten the load of your life in the physical, in the natural You'll, you'll start trying to make changes, right? You'll try to, you're going to start seeing other people because you're awful at relationships. Come on. You're going to start watching different, I'm going to stop watching scary movies because I think scary movies is why I'm having those kinds of dreams. I'm going to start doing different things with my money. I'm going to start doing things that I, hear this, I have control over. I have control over. Or maybe you'll start doing supernatural things. You'll start asking all kinds of people. My wife and I were scanning through the TV the other day, and TV is often a waste of time, but we found ourselves scanning through TV. And these people were talking to a psychic about what they should do with their future. Hear this. They were putting their future in the hands of a person, not God, and asking them what they should do in the supernatural. When the truth of the matter is they have no idea, they're just guessing. And sometimes you need to take a seat back and allow God to be who he really is. Sometimes you need to take a back seat and say, God, you're already running the ship. I have a destiny. I may be on the wrong course, but it's all going to turn around. And so finally they wake up Jonah and ask him what he's doing. And he said, I was dreaming. I was taking a nap. And so they, they figure out that it was his fault. And they ask him, who are you? Where are you from? What do you believe? What God do you serve? And Jonah said, well, I'm actually, uh, I follow the Lord. And this is all because of me. Just cast me over the boat. This is still chapter one. Just cast me over the boat and this will all go away. You know what I find interesting though? That even even when that was the simple answer, all they had to do was cast Jonah over the boat and all would go away. They wouldn't do it. Isn't it interesting at times when People in the church fail. The church is quick to kick them out the boat to make it all just go away. But even the heathens wanted to save him. Did you hear that? The church is quick to, oh yeah, let's kick him out the boat. That'll be a lot easier. We'll just get rid of the problem and all this will go away. But the truth of the matter is, even the heathens wanted to save him. So the Bible says they continued to try to lighten the boat. They tried to steer course and try to do what they could. But at the end, it proved to no avail, and so they tossed him over the boat to his death. You see, Jonah was quick to say, I'll just die. 
Because you're not going to live through something like that. I don't know if you've ever been in a storm before. It's awful. People are throwing up. People are passing out. I went fishing out into the ocean one time, and, uh, and it was not a storm. It was simply just waves. <laughs> Come on. I'm talking the waves that you see out here in the river kind of waves. It was not bad. And people are throwing up. There was, uh, there was two brothers. They were twins. They were about 14 years old. They turned to each other and threw up on each other. Like, it was crazy. And I'm looking around like, what is going on? Did they drink some of the water? I don't know what's happening. Uh, one guy is literally praying in the corner of the boat. And me, I'm just drinking water. Like, it's, it's no big deal. I'm, I'm eating a sandwich. It's okay. And they're dying, right? It wasn't one of those kind of storms. It was a raging storm where the sailors were thinking they're all going to die. This is over. And so in chapter 2, we see almost a poetic tale. Jonah gets swallowed by a big fish ordained by the Lord. It wasn't an accident. Ordained by the Lord. And for three days while he was in the fish, the Bible says that he had a conversation with God. And as he was talking with God, he was recounting how he was sinking to the depths of the ocean, even to the point where the seaweed was engulfing him, it was wrapping him up. Come on, that's the bottom of the ocean. And yet he called out to the Lord and God spared him, sent him an unnormal, everybody say unnormal, an unnormal uh, happening to save him. And at times we often look for something normal to happen. In our lives, we need something to occur in our lives that makes sense so we can explain it away. Often, my prayer is God, let the unexplainable happen because then it's not up to me. You see, if it's unexplainable, then I had nothing to do with it. If I can explain it, then it's possible I had something to do with it. You see, I love testimonies that are unexplainable. I love it when someone can't swallow and now they can swallow. I love it when someone has asthma for years and then just a moment of prayer, they can run around and they've never touched an inhaler since for years. I remember there was a time where we had a girl in youth ministry. Her knee had been blown out because her sister was with a golf club on accident and it blew out her entire knee. Casey was there, so he'll keep me honest here. Blew out her entire knee, they replaced it with plastic. But in doing so, she could not have a full range of motion. In fact, she could never jump again. And even in standing in long periods of time, it would, be, it would hurt her. So she often had to sit down during worship. You see, the enemy would try to steal your worship. He would try to steal your praise, and not for maybe the obvious reasons. We think that often worship is about us. That's why it's the most fought-over thing in church. But I, I challenge your thinking. Worship and praise is often the thing that severs a church Because it's the very thing that the Lord is seated upon. You see, the Bible says that he is seated on the praises of his people. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. And see, the moment you get rid of your opinions and you say, this is for him, in that moment, there is freedom and there is liberty. Not just for some, but for all. Not just for the ones that are participating, but for all. We see that with Paul and Silas as they're in jail or a cage. And they begin to praise the Lord, not, where, not just where they set free, but the Bible says that all captives were set free. And in that moment, the prison guard was ready to kill himself thinking it was his fault. But I'm telling you, it's somebody else's fault. It's going to be his fault, the Lord's, that you become free tonight. I believe that. I'm a fan of praise and worship. It's worth fighting for. Amen. And so in chapter 2, Jonah is talking about this and how the Lord has uh, rescued him. And I don't know about you. Has anybody ever touched a fish before? It doesn't smell like roses. (laughs) My wife loves that I fish, and she hates that I fish. I love to fish. I catch fish all the time. I was just up in Alaska this last summer, and, and we caught all kinds of fish. It was incredible. But then I came home smelling like fish. And even with that, I've never been in a fish. I don't know if I would praise the Lord for being inside of a fish with all the things that that fish has eaten. Come on. Think about it for a moment. This is not something worth praising the Lord over, and yet it's better than the death that he thought he was going to have. And so in chapter 3, this fish spits him up on the land, and this is where we are. And so I'll read this out loud, if I may. I'm almost done, and we're going to allow God to do what he will do. 
Verse 1, then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. Remember the the really good news? Hey, you're all going to die in 40 days? That one. This time Jonah, this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large it was about 120,000 people that it took three days to see it all, kind of like New York. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's kind of one of those moments where you just, after you say it, you're like, hmm, there could have been a better way to say it. That's the message I would whisper. The Bible says he shouted it, but I think I would whisper it. Or maybe send a text message. Maybe do a Facebook blast, like as it kind of makes its way into the rounds, it's okay. The people of Nineveh believe God's message, and from the From the greatest to the least, catch this, they declared a fast and put a burlap uh, and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king, an unknown king of Nineveh, heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks, may eat. Or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to seek God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God, this is important, will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. And we'll stop there for time, but listen to this. I find it interesting that sometimes even the greatest of leaders are kind of the, the last ones to do something great. Did you kind of catch how this story fell in the line? The Bible says that people from the greatest to the least did it before the king even did. Leaders, can I just be bold with you because you already said I could be? Because that's, that's who I am. You already gave me permission. It's your fault, not mine. Don't be the last one to respond. Don't wait on your throne of importance and your throne of opportunity and your throne of entitlement, your your throne of uh, abilities and, and all these things. Do not be the last one to respond to what God is doing in your midst. Don't do that. Even the least of those people were before the king. But nonetheless, the king did get the memo. And the Bible says that the king stepped down from his throne. I find it, even in Christianity, how many thrones we build. We do. At one time, I uh, I found myself struggling with the throne of entitlement. I was at a youth ministry in Enumclaw, and when Brandy, my wife, and I had got there, there was 20 people. 20 people, that's it. And most people would say, well, that's small. And, And for me, I thought, well, that's a lot of room for growth. Man, we got all kinds of room to grow. That's great. You see, for me, I, I've always been given the gift and the curse of seeing past the, the obvious. I look past the obvious all the time, and that's not always good. I'm just telling you. I know it sounds motivating right now, <laughs> but it gets you in a lot of trouble. And so I found myself looking at these 20 people, and I just started believing for more. And after a few short months, we went from 20 to 100 just in a few short months. And it's not because we were doing cool things. We were doing cool things, but it wasn't to become cool. We were doing it because we were reaching people that need to be reached, and that was it. We were preaching Jesus. We were showing Holy Spirit. We were there in, in, in the midst of a world that did not know better. And I still held on to God. But then as the next year came across, We were over 200, 250, 250 students every week, not on a special night, but every week showing up, calling out to the Lord. We had prayer services of over 100 people just praying. Junior hires, not high schoolers, not parents, junior hires, having their parents drop them off. When are you going to be done? I don't know. I'll text you. We may be here all night. I don't know. Junior hires gripping an altar, calling out to the Lord. I didn't teach any of them how to do that. And I found myself sitting on a chair, tweeting about it, 
taking pictures of people before me doing something before me. And I was sitting on a throne of entitlement. I was sitting on a throne of achievement. You see, we have got to allow ourselves to come down our throne. And this is what's interesting about the king. The Bible says he took off his royal robes. He took off the very thing that defined him to be who he was. So now, not only is he coming off the throne, he is letting go of the garments that if he went anywhere in the city, people would say, that's the king. He's a somebody. He is He is the one that rules over all. He's taken this off now. Then he puts burlap on, a sign of mourning. And then catch this. The Bible says that he didn't cover himself with ashes because that's what you should do to mourn. The Bible says that he sat down on ashes. And this is different. To sit down on ashes is to symbolize here I am as a sacrifice, positioning myself to be sacrificed. And the words that he said was this, you will all do this, even the animals. This city will become a sacrificial city. And who knows, maybe God will spare us. Isn't it amazing how quickly a heathen can have so much faith when he positions positions himself differently? You see, tonight, I believe that we have to reposition ourselves. I have been praying for this, uh, for this evening for a while now. As soon as Pastor and I came to a conclusion that I could come, I've, I've been praying, God, what, what, can I do with, uh, what can I do with what you've put in my heart? What can I bring here? And uh, I thought it was going to be really funny, right? Because at times I, I have been guilty of being a class clown. It's kind of the reason I didn't do very well in school. <laughs> I was more concerned with making everybody happy, you know, and making everybody laugh, and everybody like me, and all of that. I played sports and did all that too, but I was more concerned with being popular. And, uh, and I found that tonight I had to reposition myself so that you may reposition yourself as well. And so tonight, the tone is very much different. You see, we could talk about Jonah and how he was willing to sacrifice himself, but I find it to be a greater sacrifice for someone that didn't know God. He did his own thing. He had his own methods. He, he had his own way of life. And many of us do, don't we? We go to work at the same time. We grab that Starbucks or Dutch Brothers or whatever we go, whatever our vice is, or we make our tea. We have our order of things. Do we not? Come on. Do we not? For some of us that have Facebook, we get on Facebook for a good hour. It's devotion time. <laughs> We want to see what's going on in the world so we know how to pray better, amen? <laughs> we get on Twitter, we make sure we Instagram at least five pictures on the way to work because that, that, that sunrise is different. So we're going to take that same, come on, Instagram all over. That same dumb bird in the lake, we're going to take a picture of him again. We have our method of doing things. We come to church and we have the place where we always sit. There's certain ways we like to worship. We, we only worship a certain way because that's how, that's how I am. I mean, it, you know, it's, uh, I'm only comfortable with doing a certain way uh, of expressing my, myself to the Lord. But, but see, when you realize that your life is no longer your own. Did you hear me? When you realize that your life is no longer your own. And you are yet but just a sacrifice to the Lord. Then you will begin to worship differently. And I'm not saying that you have to get louder. No, 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 don't hear that. Loud is for the Seahawks. Loud is for birthdays and celebrations. That's loud. That's what you save loud for. I'm talking about worship where it doesn't matter what they think. It doesn't matter what he thinks or he thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what he thinks. It matters if you brought something appropriate for him. Because I'm convinced that we're more concerned with bringing something appropriate for us. Come on. We don't want to sing too loud because the chances are we're not very good at singing. We're not as good as everybody up here. So we're going to keep it down because we don't want to scare everybody off. 
One of my favorite things in youth ministry is I remember uh, for a testimony. Can I actually have you come up to the piano? Would you mind doing that for me? Um, his name is Russell, really good friend of mine. He might be one of the, the greatest men on this planet today. And he's not even a pastor. Can you imagine? You should have him sometime. He would say no because he'd be embarrassed and he'd be too humble, but he's incredible. And he struggled with severe asthma. In fact, it was so bad that uh, he would carry shots and he would carry, uh, he would take breath, like the, the breathers all the time, all the time. And it would be so bad that he would worship for one song and he'd have to sit down for the rest. Or he would just stand there. Couldn't sing out to the Lord, couldn't do anything. And, uh, and so we're praying for people and he comes up and this is not how he is. He is selfless in so many ways. He'll pray for everybody else and he'll never ask for prayer. But he really felt like God was speaking to him that night and said that this was his night. So he came up and he told me, I didn't even know that he had this. I thought he just sat down because he was praying or something, you know, something really spiritual. But he was sitting down because he feared for his life. Because the last time that he lost his breath, he went to the hospital. He almost died. And so he looked at me. He said, I have severe asthma. And I had never noticed this. But as he was telling me, I realized he never played any sports with us. He never would run around. He never would do anything. And he always had that, that uh, breather with him. Always. And I just never, I just never put it together because I'm not that smart, remember? We've talked about this. And with tears in his eyes, he comes up. And it must have been the Lord because, again, he wouldn't have done it. And he said... I think this is my night. I'd like for you to pray for me. So I walked up, and again, I, I never took school on how to pray for people. Best thing I was taught is that you grab them so they can't run away, and you pray as fast as you can before they get stronger than you. So I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, Jesus, he wants to worship you, and there's something in the way of that. Fix it. That's it. Just fix it. And he looks at me, and you'd have to know Russell to know what I'm saying, but he looked at me, and his eyes got really big. And he's like, something's happening. Something's happening. And everybody's looking at him like, because everyone at this church knew him. They knew him since he was peewee, okay? And he is really tall now. He look really weird here. He's really tall. I feel tall, which is a great feeling, but he's really tall. And I said, well, Russell, prove it. Prove that God did something. He runs through the doors and he starts doing laps outside in the parking lot. I mean, he's like running as fast as he can. And I run over to the door trying to catch him, like come back in. And he is singing out to the Lord. I can't even sing while I'm running. Come on, and I don't have asthma. And he is singing out to the Lord. You see, I'm convinced that when you reposition yourself to worship God, that things change. Things will change in the physical. God designed you from head to toe. The Bible says that he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knew you before you were even between your parents. Come on. Plans that he had for you. Plans of a a purpose and a future to further you in his kingdom. Amen? He knows you. So the things you struggle with in the natural, again, it is nothing to an almighty God. And yet I feel at times that we hold back our worship for all kinds of reasons. Maybe you're disqualified tonight. Maybe your sin has blinded you to the greatness of God. I believe that. I believe there are some in here you are wounded deeply by sin that you've allowed to put you on your own throne. Tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed all across this room, I don't do this because the Holy Spirit walks through the side door. I do this so it's a focus. 
See, this is the part where I start to disappear. I get out of the way. I used to get in the way, Pastor Vlad. I did. One other thing I forgot to tell you before we started is that I'm really aggressive when it comes to the moments like this. I fight for you even though you don't want to be fought for. I can take a really long time on one thing that God wants to do. And it's always amazing how many people actually respond. I have great endurance and stamina in moments like this. But tonight, your sin has crippled you. And I will leave it at that. For those of you that that is not the case, I ask for you to pray. Because we're asking someone crippled to move. So we need prayer to make something supernatural happen in moments like this. Your sin has crippled you. And leaders, listen, if a king can come off their throne, then so can you. This is not a place of condemnation, but this is a place of grace place of power, a place where God reigns, come on, where the Holy Spirit will move in confidence and comfort. That's you tonight. Would you simply stand where you are? Come on. Don't wait. Don't look around. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Your sin is crippling you. That's you. You don't have to wait anymore. You don't have to look elsewhere. You don't have to wait for the next time. And I understand that you're crippled. Keep praying, everybody. Don't grow tired in doing something good. Your sin is crippling you. still praying, I feel like the Lord would say this. Your frustration with how things run here is what stops you from worshiping Him in here. There are some of you that you are frustrated. It is crippling you in worshiping. There's others of you. Your frustration at your brother is what cripples you. There's others of you. The things that those people do not see is what cripples you. We're not here to embarrass. I'm not going to ask you to come up and talk about it. Because I believe what's being said is already what's said. Keep praying. Keep praying. You want to see a city of 120,000 change, you've got to get some people off their thrones. You have got to come off your thrones. I think there are more than that in leadership. In leadership. Everybody that's standing, standing. Everybody else look at me really quick. Sometimes the worst sins are not the current, but the past. They're the ones that keep coming up like I failed then. The problem is that as you keep reliving them, you keep dragging them along in your life. It's like roadkill. Does everybody know what roadkill is? It's an animal that's dead on the side of the road. It already got hit problem is we carry that around at times when I was younger I did this and you keep carrying it and it's become a part of your identity it will blind you go on it will dismantle your worship so we've got to get through this before we can go anywhere else so tonight that's you things in your past come on you stand right now in confidence you stand in confidence you don't have to wait for anybody come on don't make me get the teeth out now. 
See, in the South, they say, don't make me walk over there and slap you. I would have loved to have seen somebody do it, but nobody did it. Anybody else? 